Welcome. I'm Gary Parr, and in just a couple of minutes, we'll enjoy our conversation with Eileen Bennett from the Sampler House. But first, I want to tell you about this week's sponsors. Uh, EGA, the Embroiders Guild of America, is a community of stitch-minded people who inspire passion for the needle arts through education and the celebration of its heritage. Join today at EGAUSA.org to become a member of the community, gain access to educational opportunities, projects, and more. Online classes, current ones that you need to take a look at, Geraniums by Marilyn Hazelwood. That registration ends November 4, and then Gold Work Bracelet with Cynthia Jackson. That registration ends uh, December 2nd. Then you also want to look at, if you're a member, look at Lightning Rounds. And those are group correspondence courses that have been handpicked by the Education Department and made available for individual EGA members to register without a group for a limited time. Lightning Rounds are a great opportunity for members at large and small EGA chapters that have difficulty filling a larger group to take a correspondence course. It's also an excellent option for a small group of friends wanting to work on one of our courses, of the EGA courses, or chapter meetings wanting to explore a new technique. Current Lightning Round registration ends on December 1, and four new classes are available. How Does Your Garden Grow? Perfectly Counted Crosses. Mark and Paint on Canvas and Fabric, and Roses. And then, of course, don't forget the 2021 National Seminar, The Magnificent Stitch, in downtown Chicago. That'll be September 1 to September 5, hosted by the Great Lakes Region Chapter. And registration is underway now at egausa.org. Now, when you put together and decide what kit you want and what class you're going to take, then you'll want to uh, kit things up at Needle in a Haystack. And whether you are an experienced embroiderer seeking specialty threads, a needlework frame for a workshop, or are a beginner taking your first steps in selecting the right hoop and linen fabric for a project, you'll find Needle in a Haystack's curated collection of needlework materials and accessories comprehensive and inspiring. They are there, uh, they are there we are here to guide you in your selection of the most suitable materials to make you a success. Our expertise in a wide range of techniques and quality materials is designed to assist our customers to achieve a beautiful end result. Whether you're planning to stitch your next masterpiece with real metal threads or want to kit up a sampler project and use silk thread for the first time, we are here for you. It's our belief that needlework is a practical and rewarding luxury that is within the reach of everyone. We are proud to support this Fiber Talk show and hope it will give you a whole new perspective on the beautiful world of present-day embroidery and invite you to visit our website at needlestack.com and take a look at our offerings. Also, a note that Needle in a Haystack ships worldwide. And I ask you to support our sponsors, EGA and Needle in a Haystack, and let them know that you heard about them from FiberTalk. And now we'll listen to our conversation this week with Eileen Bennett of The Sampler House. Welcome back. I'm Gary Parr, and you're listening to Fiber Talk, the twice weekly podcast for needlework artists. Our artist this week, Eileen Bennett from the Sampler House. Hi, Eileen. Hi, Gary. Nice to be with you. Yeah, thanks for doing this. Yep. Uh, people on the a couple weeks ago, the live show, uh, Betty Howe had a, a, a de stashed her, her stash and sent us some charts to give away. And one of them was one of your designs and okay. caught my eye as I, I was showing it to the people. This is what we're giving away. And I had just pulled them out and just, all right, I'm going to give away these four. And uh, th during the show, I'm uh, describing what's, you know, what the design is. And I can't for the life of me remember what it is now. I thought, Man, I really like this. And uh, never heard of Eileen Bennett. And then your business card was in the, uh, in the bag because it was a kit. Okay. And and then you're from Michigan and I'm from Michigan, so that, all right now now we gotta we gotta connect with Eileen and and uh, do it. So I appreciate you doing the show. It's great. Oh, I love it. I looked for I looked forward to it. I've known about it for a couple of days, and I thought, oh, this is going to be fun. <laughs> We're going to talk about my very favorite subject, samplers. Yep. Yeah. Yep, we are. We are. Yep. I have to share this with you. Um, not always my friends and family know what I'm exactly about, 
<clears throat> but when they sort of learn about it, they say, oh, I think that's really nice you've got a hobby. I said, no, it's not a hobby. <laughs> well, it's nice you've got a passion. I said, don't mistake it. <laughs> I'm consumed with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And yeah. then I have to go ahead and explain a little bit. But it, it truly took over my life a number of years ago. And no matter what I know about samplers, is never enough. Um, I'm always in research. I'm always studying. I'm always learning. I, I can't explain it to anyone. It's, no, it's a yeah. passion that enters your life that you can't describe. Yep. Well, I, I remember uh, it's a few years ago now the, that uh, uh, Sampler Quarterly magazine. Yes. Um, oh, yes. Yeah. I bought a couple of issues of that at the Needlework store. Really, I, I knew antique samplers, reproduction samplers existed, but really didn't know a thing about them. And I okay. bought I bought the magazines. I thought, well, I'm going to learn. And then I looked at them, and oh, it's interesting. And went back to my needlepoint. And okay. uh, and it wasn't till I started doing fiber talk that I really came to appreciate what's you know what's behind reproduction samplers, samplers. And, and and now own several charts and have three or four in the works <laughs> on on my Wonderful. own. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, but, I like to explain um, samplers. It, it's like the classical music to the world of needlework. Mm. This is where the learning took place. Mm -hmm. And this is what's left over. We, we watched a stitcher perhaps begin a sampler. And by the time she got down to the bottom, her stitching improved greatly. Wasn't mm. necessarily meant to be framed. You know, quite often just rolled up and put away as an example. Yeah, yeah. Well, that yeah, that's just it. Yeah, not uh, not a work of art, just a functional thing yeah. to learn. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. It was a female education. Um, way back, it was limited what a woman could do to earn a living. Once in a while, if her husband died and he owned a business, she could take over the business. But to start a business as a woman, unheard of. Yeah, you know. Yeah. yeah. You could be a nurse, you could be a teacher, but you couldn't be a teacher that was married. Mm. things like that mm -hmm. so yeah these these things happen so it, yeah. it's a lot of social history as well as needlework history well how did you connect with samplers what oh this is i hope i don't make this too long of a story <laughs> we got all kinds of time Take uh, <laughs> yeah, gary i was living in hawaii and if you've lived in hawaii on the island of oahu you quickly learn that the island the city of honolulu has over a million plus people and the island itself is the size of kent county here in grand rapids michigan uh -huh. <laughs> there's two main highways so at peak travel time it what should take 20 25 minutes to get to a destination can take two and a half hours mm. <laughs> and the y i think it was the y y m c a in in honolulu had a lot of classes that they would do and they had classes that they called pow pow hana classes pow meaning end of and hana meaning work so end of work mm -hmm. so instead of going out and fighting the traffic come on in take a class then go home you're going to get home about the same amount of time you know <laughs> yep and it was great and there were so many classes it was almost like a small catalog well, I've always wanted to learn how to do needlepoint or canvas work, as it's properly called. And they were offering a class, which I signed up for. Well, a lot of people signed up for it, and they only had one main teacher. So the overflow they gave to a woman who was mainly a potterer. Does this make sense? <laughs> okay. 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 I'm, I'm tracking with you, but it, okay. no, no, it doesn't make a lick of All sense. Right. No. <laughs> this is, this is, I, I got to go on. But she was a very smart teacher. There were about 11 or 12 of us in the class. Um, made a good friend there that was from Australia. She was a neat gal. She would assign each of us a class lesson to teach or a stitch to teach. Mm. So what we learned was charted needlepoint charted canvas work uh -huh. now this was about 1972 that's how long ago yeah okay so about the end of 1972 i come back to the grand rapids area my husband had what they call rock fever get me off this island i can't <laughs> handle it anymore and we came back to grand rapids and two or three years later 
counted cross stitch was introduced in our area. Mm -hmm. And I looked at it and I thought, oh, I've learned how to do a half a cross. I can do this. Yeah. So I signed up for the class, made two of my friends to sign up with me. And they never did needlework either, so it was okay. And the lady that was teaching the class was the woman that started our Embroiders Guild here in Grand Rapids oh. area. Oh. So she could see I was getting very enthused about this project. And she said, why don't you join our EGA group? So I did that fall. Uh, my other two friends could have cared less. In fact, a couple of years later, I opened a needlework store with a friend. And one of the friends that had learned County Cross Stitch with me comes in the store with their unfinished project, flops it on the counter and said, I haven't even finished my project and you got a needlework store. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other thing that happened that probably opened my eyes, Gary, was I've been an antiquer for some time, and oh. I used to see the antique samplers, uh -huh. and I used to marvel at them, but because I didn't stitch, I didn't really understand what they were about. And then I remembered they were done in a cross stitch. Mm -hmm. and it was like this little flame got lit, and then this explosion happened. <laughs> but there wasn't much written at the time on the subject of samplers. And, and anything I could get my hands on, I was reading. Uh, any collection that I could see, I was going to see it, studying them. And I have to be honest with you, I love to look at the front side of a sampler for about two minutes, and then I want to see the back side. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. that tells me how it was stitched. Yep. And that's where the story is. Yep. I agree with you 100%. I love looking yeah. at the back. You know, people, don't look yeah. at my back. No, I want to see... How you go about it, yeah. Yeah, yep. yeah, and that's, um, well, with some of the old samplers, I, you're probably aware that I've written a number of books on, on the stitches of samplers. Yes. Okay. Many of them, well, Montenegrin stitch, for one, was only recorded in one book, and it was a DMC, no, I think, yeah, it was a DMC book, and that was towards the end of the 1800s, but it was an old stitch. Mm-hmm. And... How to do some of these stitches, uh, it, it, it just wasn't clear how they were done. So being at kindergarten level, I dissected these stitches, and that's what my stitch books are all about. It's about you can do this too. If I can learn this, you can learn this. Mm -hmm. So I, I take it apart, you know, one, two, three, four, so on. So you got – so that you just dove right into the giant <laughs> – Oh my gosh, yes. Yeah, like I said, you know, this little flame was ignited with with the the potterer in yep. my class in Hawaii. <laughs> and then the explosion occurred when I got back to Michigan. Yeah. And um oh it was nuts. Uh when I had my needlework store and I specialized in samplers, I had a little corner and then during the month of February I guess because it was George Washington's birthday and Lincoln's birthday, I sort of called it Patriotic Month. And nothing was more patriotic to me than a small girl sampler. Mm -hmm. So a few of my friends, um, we live in the Dutch area, as you probably know, Grand yep. Rapids. So yep. Dutch samplers were, oh, I don't want to see in excess, but there were a few around. And uh, I would encourage the people that stitch the samplers to bring in their models. So all over the walls, are these samplers during yeah. the month of February. I think one of the funniest things that happened, a mom comes in one day, and he's about four, a very well-behaved little guy, kind of with his hands behind his back, as you would expect a little museum goer to uh -huh. do. Yeah. And he's looking at all these samplers, and he's just taking everything in, and mom's now up at the counter paying for a purchase, and I've got samplers behind me, and he says... Wow, Mom, somebody doesn't know their alphabet. <laughs> <laughs> I lost it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I knew I couldn't explain to him, make right. it clear enough at that age so that he would understand, so right. I just left it. <laughs> just let it ride, yep. Yeah, yeah, it was great. That's interesting now. Uh, of course, growing up in Michigan myself, um, Dutch samplers, but then you've you've done quite a bit of exploration of samplers that are in Michigan. 
I have. In fact, I started on, um, I guess I self-appointed <laughs> <Michigan>, myself. <laughs> Michigan, probably not on the top 10 list of sampler resources. <laughs> You're, that's exactly right, which led me into another project, which I'll go into too. But um, I sort of appointed myself as a sampler survey person. Um, back in 1976, the Quilters Guild did a quilt survey of Michigan-made quilts. Uh, Sue, um, oh, I'm trying to think of Sue's last name. I know it as well as I know my own. Uh, Sue Studebaker, <clears throat> who wrote two books on Ohio samplers, was a friend of mine. She has since passed, and that was such a loss. But she had done two beautiful books, and she was encouraging me. What have you done with the Michigan? I said, nothing. She said, well, get going. Get at it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ohio had a richer history than what Michigan did. Mm -hmm. um, and I kept hitting roadblocks. Now, we, we uncovered a few, not tremendous amount, but because many of the, well, I have to go back. Michigan started to be settled about 1833 outside of the Detroit area. So that's a little late for sampler making, really. Mm -hmm. And those that were coming into Michigan were coming in from New York and Connecticut. Yeah. And they were bringing New York and Connecticut styles with them. Mm -hmm. So unless it said Michigan, unless you knew who the family was, where they were, where the kids went to school, could you identify a Michigan sampler? Was there an identifying mark that said, oh, this was made in Michigan? Yeah. Yeah. It, it created so many problems, I can't tell you. <laughs> yeah. So I hit, I, I sort of, well, I did, I hit a roadblock. Um, I've been doing genealogy for 40 plus years. So I said to myself, well, what do I know about my own county, uh, Kenton County, Grand Rapids, Michigan? Well, simple things I learned in school. Well, when did the people start coming into the area? I didn't know. Well, you better find out. So I went back to the history books, and I think there were five. And out of those five, I was able to pull out 35 pioneer teacher names. Mm. And that, that took me from about, well, the first one came in 1834, and that's a story by itself, uh, through the Civil War. And I thought, they're more than a name. They had lives. They had families. I, I need to find out about them. Well, make a long story short, there are four books that I wrote on them. Mm -hmm. and, the, and I called it boarding around because that's exactly what they did. Uh, they would be in areas, of course, transportation was limited. So they would actually stay with the families in the school area where they were teaching, the one-room schools. And uh, that could be interesting because yeah. sometimes they'd have to sleep with their, their students. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I remember one story, one woman, she had this one-room schoolhouse, and she had a loft, a tiny little loft up above one corner of it. And she had a ladder that went up to it, and she made an area where she could sleep. And then the stove that kept the schoolroom warm is where she prepared her meals. Uh -huh. She had had enough of boarding around, so she was <laughs> down there. So anyway, I thought, well, if I could pick out what they were teaching, maybe that would give me an insight. But it didn't. It just led me on to another project. So I finished up Kent County and then went on to Ionia County because the early people who came, part of them stayed there, mm -hmm. which is the county next to us. And um, for the last five or six years, I had over 700 names of these oh. early pioneer teachers. And I've been doing the genealogy on all of them, all of mm. them that I can Mm. So that took me out of the needlework field, still in the research, and still with teachers, but I'm not finding the Michigan information I was looking for. Uh huh. Yeah. So that that creates a problem. Of course, we're talking. I uh, I don't want to call it public edu public education, because it really wasn't public education. Yeah. You had to pay. You had to pay. You know. There were so many in a village, you had to pay so much to send your kids to school, and then you had to provide firewood to keep the kids warm, uh, and uh -huh. on and on and on, you know? Yeah, sure. um, Yeah. So there were subscription schools, but trying to find them is almost impossible without going through newspapers. 
day by day by day. Oh, really? Oh, even yeah. even today with the Google and everything else, still difficult. Yes. Huh? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. People didn't pay attention to it, so it wasn't really recorded and yeah. kept as a quick reference. So you're you're constantly digging. Yeah. I feel like I got calluses on my hands from this shovel in my my <laughs> hands all the time. <laughs> so where where do you where do you encounter the Dutch samplers? Do you just trip over them at some point? Yeah, um, one of my friends uh, had a family piece that was most interesting over in Holland, Michigan, which is about twenty five minutes from me, twenty five miles, is um, a Dutch museum. Mm -hmm. And they, I think there are a few in there. Last I Last I knew, but Just, they're interesting. Um, Martin X, are you familiar with that name? No. Okay, Martin X has an antique shop that specializes in Dutch samplers in um, Amsterdam. Okay. And you got to tap into Martin X. Okay. He's, he's a neat, neat gentleman. All right. And you'll see a lot of Dutch samplers there. They're unique. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, how compare those to, uh, you know, British, European samplers, uh, uh, different color palettes, different uh, motifs? Um, different motifs. Uh, a lot of them, because they still wore their ethnic costumes, a lot of the band designs would be used on headband pieces or hem areas of, of skirts, mm -hmm. things like that. Uh, a lot of things that pertain to the Netherlands, of course, uh, being on the sea, you'd see ships, uh -huh. things like that. Uh, yeah. They're heavily the the fabric is usually heavily embroidered. Uh, the Dutch are very thrifty people. You wouldn't want to waste any any linen, so you'd want to use all of that fabric. So no blank canvas, huh? <laughs> no, no, no blank canvas. Uh, they also had a unique alphabet. The uppercase is very unique, but if you carefully look at the lowercase alphabets, you'll, f and I'm not going to tell you what it is. I'm going to let you explore this for yourself. Okay. There's an unusual letter, and every time I see that letter, I can say Dutch or Dutch influenced. You can tell, that, that's your, that's your key, huh? Yep. <laughs> now, is, is there, are there a lot of them? in Michigan or just the smattering that uh, a museum might have? Oh, that's a good question. I think our Grand Rapids Museum has maybe one or two. Okay. And I last I looked, they had 52 samplers here in Grand Rapids. Um, of course, you know, when you say samplers in museum, people think, oh, I'm going to go to the museum and I'm going to see them. Yeah. Textile, about... 10% of a collection, the entire collection of a museum is out and on exhibit. The 90% is back in the archives. Yeah. So you have to make appointments to get to see them. And they can be hard to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sure they're reluctant uh, for a lot of reasons. Yeah. Well, sometimes it's just uh, the lack of staff mm -hmm. because they don't like to leave you alone with the pieces, which I understand. Right. So that means they have to have a person that sits with you. Mm. And there's the hours right there. Yep. 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 So done. a lot of things happen. So when you when you request, you know, a visit into the archives, understand these things. Be patient with the people. Be gracious. Be thankful. Uh, don't take anything for granted because you don't know how much of their work they had to set aside to be with you. Yeah. Just just sitting there answering. Just sitting the, there doing nothing. Yeah. Answering yeah. the idle question or the occasional question, yeah. yeah. And usually if you've been into samplers long enough, you start answering questions, and they look at you and they say, I think you know more than I do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to sit here and read my book while you look. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, so I'm going, oh, okay. <laughs> what's, that, what's that experience like for you to go, you know, let's just stay with Dutch samplers, to go in there and be able to see the collection do you do you start laying them out side by each and and uh comparing and contrasting what what goes through your mind when you study those well usually you're not allowed to touch them oh, okay. that's usual there yeah. are exceptions and there was one huge one i'll tell you about 
um, usually they you tell them what you want to see and um, if you're not specific then they bring out what they think is interesting or what they can easily get at mm -hmm. and they'll bring them out and they'll be set on a table and you're able to look at them and then if I want to look at the back side I'll have to say to them could you turn it over for me mm -hmm. um, and then you know I'm I've got my seven power magnifying glasses on and my other seven power in my hand and I'm going over that thread by thread. Yeah. Yeah. So, and they're just sitting there and they're going, Oh God, I wish you'd get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm totally mesmerized. Yeah. I was going to say, hours. yeah, you're, you're camped for the day. You're good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Making notes and all kinds of things. Yeah. It's, it's a crazy world. Or, just, no, 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 no. Let me rephrase that. I'm probably crazy. <laughs> well, whatever works. Does whatever it, works. Do, do you start, uh, when you look at them, though, I assume you start to see patterns, start to be able to know a, a teacher, um, pick out, up on those things? Sometimes. Not yeah, always. Not always. Okay. Yeah. Um... The, old, the old it depends routine. Yeah. yeah, and and sometimes you can just totally be mistaken. You say, oh, I know what this is. And then you go back to the records and see what's written down. You go, oh, well, I missed that one. <laughs> uh, but keep in mind, say a girl goes to a finishing school, and she's learning this, and she's learning the techniques, and she wants to earn a little bit of a living. She discovers she can get paid for teaching, so she's going to teach what she's learned. Mm -hmm. So it's the same techniques that are being handed down, but not by the primary person that began with this technique yeah. or this motif mm -hmm. or this style. Yeah. Is it the history or the needlework that intrigues you the most? Oh, boy. That's a hard one to choose. Uh, I think being a researcher, I'd probably have to say the history first. Yeah. Uh, it was just like my notebook of sampler stitches. It was It's the very first time that the history of the stitches, as I could find it and as I knew it, came together with the diagrams. Very first time. Mm -hmm. um, some stitches, they're called different things in different countries. I'm in uh, Ireland, and I'm working with Heather Crawford, and I'm working at the Ulster Folk Museum. And she keeps referring to the Rococo stitch. And I said, oh, Heather, I said, in America, we call the Rococo stitch a queen stitch. Hmm. She said, oh, Eileen, she said, if we called it a queen stitch here, we'd be so confused. She said, what you call a queen stitch, we call a four-sided stitch here in Ireland. <laughs> okay. So that that was kind of a funny little story but yeah. she she wrote um, the only book that's been written on northern irish samplers and then she used some of my stitch diagrams in the back of the book so mm -hmm. that was fun so I've it's so the, the, the stitch names are no different than uh, common names for animals and plants in the yeah, it depends yeah. on the region of the yeah. area that you're at a good another good one is uh, bargello flame stitch Irish stitch. It was called Irish stitch because the Irish nuns did a lot of it. Oh, okay. <laughs> For no other reason than that. Yeah. 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 And I, as I know the names of stitches, as I can research them, uh, say I put a four sided stitch in my notebook of sampler stitches, I'll give you all the alternative names too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if there's a confusion in your mind, and then in the back, I have it all indexed so you can refer to whichever. Yeah. Well, that's fun. That's fun too, because I often think, uh, well, really, with any needlework, that it would be fun. I, I can I can always just envision a giant map that shows how the techniques moved throughout the world and throughout time. Yeah. You know, the, yeah. the same. It's basically the same techniques. Uh, well, you also have to go back to textiles. Yeah. Textiles that were being imported, say, from India and so forth into England. Uh, the style or the coloration of the period influenced the needlework of the period. Mm -hmm. So you have to look at this as well. You can't just be, what do I want to say, um, single focused. Yeah. Yeah. You, you have to almost know the history of the era, the history of the place, 
to understand the needlework of the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah, where it came from. Yeah. It, yep. It, yep. Yep. What influenced it? What was going on at the time? Were there wars? Um, were people coming in because they were driven out of their country? Mm -hmm. uh, just various things were happening and brought their techniques with them. You, you hear the term black Irish. These mm -hmm. were the black haired Spaniards that were exiled from Spain coming into Ireland and stayed. And of course brought their techniques with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, yeah, that's where, that's where samplers, but needlework in general, historic needlework in general, it, it almost gives you a, a book in its own right of, of history. Yeah, yeah it if does. Can, if you can follow, if you can do the research <laughs> to follow it. Yeah. 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 If you can say, follow one area, one small area, one small teacher, and maybe their teaching years were only three or four, maybe less than 10 years. They had a lot of students. Mm -hmm. You can follow it that way, but how often does that happen? Right. Right. Yeah. Well, now you did a lot of your research before we had the internet. Yes. So that's that's hard work. <laughs> oh my God! Yeah, I I can't tell you. Like I said, when I started out, um, I took that class in 1975, counted cross stitch, and then joined the Embroiders Guild in Grand Rapids here uh, that fall. Um, I'm trying to think how many books, history books, I could put my finger on maybe one maybe two that i could put my finger on that was written on the history of samplers uh-huh yeah and of course when the internet came in and um it opened it up you could now search for a book online you may find it in england you may find it on the west coast but you can get it mm -hmm. yeah or maybe a library it shows up it's at a particular library and you can read it online so those things happen yeah, gives you yeah, opens some doors for you. Yep. Yeah, yep. but I won't tell you what my library looks like because you probably wouldn't <laughs> believe it. <laughs> well, yeah, that's I'm, I'm sure it's massive. Uh, you know, cause you, I because I have more I have more needlework books than most libraries have. I'm sure of that. Yeah. Well, and I got to believe you know before the internet, you find a book like that, you grab it. Oh, and, yeah. my gosh, yes. I think the most I paid for a book, and I. No, I don't even know if I want to tell people this. <laughs> it probably, well, I know one did. I bought a, an exhibit book that was written by Betty Ring before she came out with her two-volume set, and I paid nineteen ninety-five for it. Last I saw it listed on the Internet, it was going for $650. <laughs> so those are, you know, treasures. Um, the most I've paid is $350, but it was a book I knew I would never see again. Mm -hmm. And I and I wanted it. Yeah, yeah. So grab what's going to happen? Grab it to and my... keep it from going to the trash somewhere. Yep. Exactly right. So what is going to happen to my library someday? I said to my daughter, I said, if you don't have an interest in it, I said, find a needlework book dealer before you just put it in a garage sale. Yep. Well, it, you know that's the thing. In today's libraries. You know, they're just shedding books because they want space oh, yeah. for, for computers. And, right. you know, how many of those books that, how many, you know, one-off instances in libraries all over the world, certainly in this country, have thrown away books that will never be seen again? You know, you just really have oh, to wonder. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah, I've got a number of them that you open up the cover and it says withdrawn, and then it gives the library name. Mm-hmm. Yep. And I'm going, you got rid of this? Why? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Unless they uh, had 10 copies. I don't know. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, but no, I that, that's to me is the real crime. But you understand, you know, where are they going to put all these books that nobody's checking exactly. out anymore? Yeah. What are you yeah. going to do? Yeah. 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 And the space is getting limited, you know, for libraries. Um, right. Well, we just put a, a new library in in our township here. And it was fought probably for three or four elections in a row before people finally saw the need for it. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that's happening all over the country. You know, people are hurting. They don't have jobs right now. Right. They're going to vote to have more taxes. I don't think no, so. Probably not. No. Yeah. Well, and, and the function of the library has changed in the last 
seven, eight, ten years dramatically uh, in terms of, of the services they provide. That's it's, true. It's not just a house for books anymore. There's so much more to it. And books just get shoved to the corner because of that. Yeah, except they do provide, you know, the meeting room. Um, I see one-on-one uh, -on -one instructors working with students. Right. Uh, probably, I, I think a lot of them are being educated in English. I know my high school that I graduated from, which was predominantly white when I was there. Now it has, um, because I've belong to an alumni group. I know this. There are 14 ethnic groups that are in the school district today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. And but it was a blue collar area when I was in high school in our alumni group. We, all we do, that's our whole purpose, is we furnish scholarships for these kids. Mm -hmm. And a number of them are homeless. They come in on buses in the morning from inner city. Mm. I, I have to share this with you because I'm so proud of it. This is something any group can do if you are really interested in it. We gave out 43 $4,000 scholarships each plus 25 $2,000 scholarships wow. each for kids that were in school already in college. Hmm. Wow. 43. Wow. Yeah. And we didn't, we didn't say you had to have a certain grade point average. All you had to have was a desire to go to school. Mm -hmm. And you write a little essay and you tell us why, and we'll see that you get there. That's fantastic. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yep. yeah. So nothing to do with needlework, but, no, it, but it is education. You that's know? right. That's right. So what, what is your, do you have a collection of uh, originals? I do. Um, not a huge collection, Gary, and people are usually surprised or amazed when I say that. I have probably less than 12. My oldest one is English piece. It's seventeen ninety nine, and I did re reproduce it. It's a Betsy Patrick sampler. Um, because I work with them in museums and see collections all the time, I guess I don't feel that need to own them. Yeah. Yeah, see, that doesn't surprise me that you don't have a lot of them for that very reason. Yeah. Yeah. You they, know they, you know yeah. where they are. You know they're safe in some museum somewhere. And mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when you hang them in your house, you, you really have to be careful where you put them. You don't want them on an outside wall where moisture can get into the back. You don't want them into direct uh, sunlight or lamp light. So it's you're kind of limited where you can hang them safely. Yeah. So that, that puts a damper on things, too. Right, and owning them and having them in a drawer, that's not much yeah, fun. Yeah, it's not the same thing. <laughs> you know, you want to enjoy them. You know, your own needlework, you usually put it in a frame. Yep. Uh, although I got I to gotta confess here, maybe I shouldn't. Oh, I will anyway. I think I've designed, oh, it's over 100. And I can count probably five or six that hang in my house. Mm-hmm. The yeah. rest, I, I've stored them away while I used to do trade shows, and, you know, you were always transporting them. Mm -hmm. So yep. they got stored in, in storage trunks, <laughs> yep. and that's where they are today. <laughs> yep. That's terrible to say, isn't it? It'll be, be the kid's problem someday, yeah. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, think you, I think you could read my mind on that one. Yep. Oh, yeah. So I'm not what, gonna worry about this. <laughs> when it comes, because you, you've reproduced, and then you've also done originals. Yes. Is it, did the originals, uh, is that what kind of gets your heart racing because of the creativity there? Do you borrow a lot from uh, reproductions to, or from antiques to make your originals? How do you go about that? All of the above. Okay. Yeah. The, the antique ones inspire me incredibly. I've got, oh God, notebook after notebook after notebook of drawings that I've made at various museums and so on. Mm -hmm. um, they do inspire me. Um, I particularly enjoy the 17th century band samplers, probably because of the variety of stitches and stitch techniques that were on them. Um, uh, they hold a fascination for me. I can't quite describe, and a lot of my reproduction, or not reproduction, but newly created pieces are in a band sampler format. 
Yeah, I noticed that. A lot of that. Yes. Yeah. So that has influenced me greatly. And, of course, then we get into the other techniques of reticella in laces, which is spelled L-A-C-I-S, which is a weaving technique. Um, just just a tremendous amount of things occur on those pieces. Mm -hmm. So the interest is there. So you, so you migrate to the pieces that offer more than just simple cross-stitch. Yes. In fact, I've done very few that are just cross-stitch. Mm -hmm. Very few. I don't want to say I'm bored with it. But <laughs> well, they all have I their place. I, yeah, they do. Yeah. They do. And in some very important museum pieces, um, 19th century pieces, mainly are just cross stitch, and they're still very appealing. I yeah. love them. Yeah. Because you talk about in your designs, uh, designs that are challenging, and then others that are, what, what did you say? Um, comforting or relaxing or something like that yeah and, yeah and intentional on your part in your designs to create one over the other well i'll let you in on a little secret gary and it's what i tell my students i only i only use stitches that i love to use mm -hmm. um so if i don't find a teaching piece fun to do it's not going to be fun for my students to do either mm-hmm so that's kind of my concept. If it's not fun, I'm not going to do it. But maybe that's my philosophy in life. <laughs> but <laughs> those that know me from my teaching know that I come from an Irish family. And I always have to say, yes, it's true. We're about 10 feet off center. And nothing can bring us back. We're just <laughs> dippy people. <laughs> but we have fun. <laughs> and if it's not fun, I'm not going to do it, Gary. <laughs> uh -huh. Yep. Yeah, but you but you do you you enjoy putting in the different stitches and and yeah, I'm probably one of the very very few teachers that teach the holly point stitch. It's um, <laughs> it's a complex stitch. It takes me three pages probably to explain it and diagram it, and it takes me thirty seconds to show it to you. <laughs> okay. But you you you. You have to get your thumb involved. It, it's it's a real challenge when I get a left-hander in my class. It's the only stitch I can't do left-handed. Mm. And they have to do different things. Some stand behind me. Some have to sit in front of me to duplicate it. <laughs> I, um, I happened to teach that stitch for an online EGA class about a year ago. And I had, I think, 107 students. Maybe it was more than that. And I went, oh, boy, <laughs> mm -hmm. I've got this holly point stitch to do. What am I going to do? <laughs> so I called my tech-savvy granddaughter, as probably the rest of people who have grandchildren. Our kids learn keyboarding in preschool. Right. We were. This was our typing classes in high school. So they're just way above us. So I said, Aaron, I've got to demonstrate this class. Can we make a small video so I can show it to the to the ladies because I was getting all these comments I can't do this stitch and I kept saying give me 30 seconds and I'll show you how easy it is <laughs> so that's exactly what she illustrated with the video is me doing the stitch uh -huh. and I didn't have anyone that said they couldn't do it yeah there you go works yeah. well I have to look yeah, up the holly does. point stitch I don't know that one Oh, you can you can even get a hold of me, Gary. I can give you an online class. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We can do a one on one here. <laughs> okay. You'd be you'd be amazed sometimes how many phone calls I get or emails from people and it is a one on one class. Mm hmm. Yep, well, it's a good resource. If you're willing to do it, that's fantastic. <laughs> well, yeah. you know, I, I nothing gives me greater pleasure and I'll have to go back on a story. Let me go back on the story first, and then I'll tell you. I walked into a classroom one day, and the girl was sitting in the front row, and she was crying. I felt terrible. I didn't know quite what to say. I didn't know if I should invade her private space, and I finally got the courage to go over to her, and I said, did something sad and bad happen? She said, no. She said, I just don't think I can do this class. And the tears were running down oh her my. cheek. Oh, my. And I said, 
will you just stay with me? Will you give me a chance? And she said she would. And there she is in front row, so I can't let her down. Right. <laughs> and she can't escape out the back door. Right. By the end of the class, there was a smile on her face, and she said, yes, I can. Yeah, there you go. Yep. Yeah. That's teaching right there. Well, I, you know, it probably started back with my uh, needle needlework store that I had. That's another story, but... Anyway, uh, Lennon was just coming. Remember, two years after I had the class, I got now I have a needlework right, store. Right, right. And everything was done. Some people call it Ada cloth, but at that time we were calling it Aida cloth. Uh huh. Yep. And hardanger cloth, not hard dunger. Hard right. anger. Okay. Well, and that and was Lynn, back in the day when there were cross stitch shops everywhere. They were like yeah. gas stations. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. In fact, from that um, Aida. In the Hardanger and all that, uh, there was a book that came out. It was called Opera Stitch. Do you remember that? No, Opera Stitch? Opera Stitch. It was just decorative stitches on Aida cloth. But oh, they took oh. the Aida name, which was, uh, you know, um, mm -hmm. classical music. Right. That's that's what it come from. Anyway. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, Okay, so linen is coming in, and I'm trying to encourage people to get into linen because this is what the samplers were all about. So I would custom cut linen for my customers, and I often had little pieces left over. So I took a little wicker basket, and I took those pieces, and I took needle and thread, and I would do one cross stitch on this piece of linen, then I'd put the needle with the thread back in the fabric and set by my cash register. And I put a sign on it says, try me. Oh. So they come up to the register and they would make a comment. And I said, well, give it a try. Just duplicate what I done on the, on the linen for you. And they'd pick it up and they'd do it and they'd say, I can do this. I said, yes, you can. Mm -hmm. And we converted them. <laughs> but you, you, you know, you have to, you have to show them that, they can do this yeah yeah yep <laughs> yeah that was my i remember my my first the only the first class actually the only cross stitch class i ever took was back geez i don't i, I still have the sampler it was a sweetheart tree <laughs> or whatever and, <laughs> sure and well uh, she lived in you know she lived in the chicago area at that time oh no i didn't know that uh, okay but of course I, I was the only male in the class but it was a class on stitching on linen <laughs> okay like it was you know like some insurmountable thing to do and and uh so i went and i i of course way out of place they all looked at me like i was weird but um yeah it was, it was I like, have, i've had a number of men in classes gary so <laughs> don't feel badly about that but it was you know the first class what's the big deal here it's just a grid it just so I, I never, I've always struggled with that because it, it's just a grid. Um, but I, yeah, but, I mean, some people struggle with it and I, under, you know, I, I don't know. I, I probably can, under, I can explain that to you. A man has an innate ability for architecture. And that's exactly what you were doing. You were building a stitch on a grid. Hmm. And a woman doesn't often see it through that eye. Oh, so it's, so it's, so it's me that's the problem. It's, okay. a, it's a man thing. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and uh, a lot of the men in uh, Europe, uh, particularly the Norwegian countries, um, they did a lot of stitching. Mm -hmm. uh, especially the sailors, you know, they had a lot of downtime. Yeah. Some beautiful needlework has come out from men stitching. Well, that's good to know that it's just me. Okay, fine. No, 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 no. <laughs> I've, had, I've, I've had a lot of men in my classes over the years. Yeah. Well... That was yeah, it was a big deal. Learn to stitch on linen, and so what, what is the this whatever? You going, you going? What's a big deal? Yeah, <laughs> why am I here? <laughs> yeah, I love it. But I did finish it. I finished it and uh, had it framed, and still have it today. So um, yeah, you enjoyed it. That yeah, was the oh main yeah, thing. yeah, yep. Because uh, yeah, my experience had been on on Ada or Aida. Uh, cloth that's funny you know it depends Op on opera which stitching area the, it depends on which area of the country you came from how they pronounced it I, well, I still pronounce it aida and people look at me and i said well that's what it was called when i was buying it by 15 and 20 yard bolts yep yep um 
So I I don't know. You just stick with it. Yep. Yeah. You now do. you've done a bunch of books, a, a whole bunch of I books. I have. I have. The one that intrigued me of the list that I was able to find was the Monogram album. Oh, that's a beautiful book, Gary. I own the original, and it was probably printed in the late 1800s. And I had kept it for years. It was on one of my bookshelves, and I would get it out and look at it from time to time. And finally, one day, I said, this is stupid. I should be sharing this book with others. Mm -hmm. So I I can still remember it was winter months and you know you don't get out too much during the winter months in Michigan necessarily. Yeah. So I started in uh each page had its own letter and all variations of a letter. So I started in and it would take me probably 4 or 5 hours to reproduce that one page. So I did all of that, and I put it into a book form. I've also got a class that lets you design your own piece with decorative stitches using your initial page. Uh huh. And that that's a fun, but it's a beautiful book. If you need a resource on alphabets, there's none like it out there. Now, is it uh, uh, all cross stitch or embroidery, or how did you? How did you... I just I just charted it so you can do whatever you want with it. Okay. That's what I teach in my class is how to apply the various stitches to various areas. Mm -hmm. But certainly it can just be a cross stitch. Yeah. And okay. still be beautiful. But it's the it's the shapes that you've preserved. Yes. Okay. Cuz that one, yeah, of all of them, well that one and the um a pulled thread stitches were the two that uh you know, I, my initial reaction was I got to get my hands on those, but that monogram, <laughs> you know, that monogram one just kind of stuck out for me because it looked like it was one of those that you'd have sitting around and just pull out at any number of times because it would you, be. You would for yeah. various projects, you know, even if you just want to give a gift and, and do one of these beautiful monograms and cross stitch it for someone, put it into a frame. It's just a great gift. Yeah. yeah. Or on the front of a bag or, you know, whatever. Right. Right, yeah, that that kind of thing, and then the pulled thread stitches—that uh, simply that a collection of stitches and how to do them. It is. There are, I think, eighty-two or eighty-three stitches in the book. Um, in fact, I have a class that I I use the entire book and every stitch in the book. I just completed an online class with the base Bay Area Sampler Guild. In fact, I concluded the class. It was seven weeks long last week. And um, it, it was every stitch is used in it. Mm -hmm. So it's it's uh, it's an interesting technique. I love anything that's counted. So not only do you have you know pull thread. Um, there's one book that you didn't mention to me, and it was my newest book. It's called Darn Beautiful, and it's a collection of weaving designs that I've translated into cross stitch and also into pattern darning. Oh. And then I, I even put a project in the back of the book. Mm. And uh, that is very restful to do, the the pattern darning. If you've not done it, take a look at it. Okay. No, haven't done that one. All right. I'll have to check that out. Yep. Yeah. And then black work, of course, is in that same group. And hard anger. Um, I do hard anger. I don't teach it, but I do I do work it. Yeah, that, um, I, I enjoy that. I think that's, uh, I, I don't know, something about white on white that I just enjoy in general. But um, It's elegant. Uh, yeah. It's just absolutely elegant. Yeah. When you get some of those, uh, uh, Blonde Camp is one where, you know, just bring out all the texture and, and uh -huh. it's, it's just white on white. And to me, that's, it's just beautiful to look at. And You almost sound like you should be a photographer, Gary. Well, I am. texture. Okay, because that's what. <laughs> That's what a photographer goes yep. for is the texture. No, I am. I am a photographer. I, okay. I don't, do, I don't uh, do enough of it these days. But, uh, oh, yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. It's the, um, well, it, you know, I was taught when it came to photography is if the, the way to learn it is to shoot black and white. Because, yes. Because then you'll, you'll know uh, light and contrast and texture and all the things. And then uh, yeah. color covers, covers up so many mistakes. And, oh, yep. you got it. Yeah. Yep. 
And of course, when you're doing uh, the decorative stitches, the lighter the thread you use, the better you can see the stitches. Mm -hmm. So if mm -hmm. you're doing queen stitches, don't do them in a dark blue or dark red or whatever. Uh, keep the, the thread color a little bit lighter and you'll see the beauty of the stitch. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's one That's one where I get, that can get muddied up in a hurry, the queen stitch, where it just loses all of its definition. And I've seen that more than once, yeah. Okay, yep. that's one of my... In fact, I'm working on a piece right now. It's entirely done in queen stitches. Oh, really? Yeah, nothing else. Oh, <laughs> that'll take a minute to do. It, it was a, a chart that I was able to put my hands on that was done, and I think... If I can recall now, sixteen ninety nine, mm. and it was charted, but it, to my knowledge, it was never stitched. So I'm recreating it, and it's okay. all done in queens. Wow, wow. Yeah. So if you want a little little bit of a, a challenge, I'll guarantee you, when you finish it, you'll be the queen of the queen stitchers. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> You're on, Gary. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, it's tempting. <laughs> it's tempting. I like a good challenge, so okay. that's all right. So these these days you're you're, uh, you're writing more books, uh, doing designs. What? You know, I'm always designing because I'm always doodling. Okay. I also got into Zentangle, which is an art form, mm -hmm. and um, black work is similar to Zentangle. Okay. So you might want to look into that. Um, and of course, my genealogy research that's ongoing. I've done my family and. Um, I did, well, Jane Bostock, in fact, England's still angry with me because I gave them the rest of the story, but it took me nine months to do it. Um, okay. I don't know. I don't know Jane Bostock from Jane Bostock. Okay. Let me tell you about Jane Bostock. She's England's oldest sampler, 1599 or 98. Okay. And she was done by Jane Bostock and she worked it for little, um, Oh, gosh, the name's going right through my head right now, Alice Lee. And I was on a tour bus with a bunch of girls from England. We were out at Sampler Gathering. I was teaching. I had the day off, and we were, I don't know, some excursion. And I turned to Linda, and who was the head of the Sampler Guild, and I said, Linda, has anything been found more about Jane Bostock? It was found in an attic in 1960. It was found north of England, and they had the sampler. And they could tell you all about the sampler, but they didn't know anything more about it. She said, yes, as a matter of fact, in a publication that was called Country Life, something like that, she said nothing to do with needlework. A woman claims um, she knows who the Bostek family was mm -hmm. and gave clues to it. She said, when I get home, I'll make a copy of the article, and I'll send it to you. She did, and, well, I was intrigued, and now I had to kick into my genealogy. <laughs> so, I st yeah. so I started in, and I can see it was not going to be a simple task. But along the way, and because I'm using the Internet, I connected with a man by the name of, um, I'm not sure his last name was um, Lee, Alan something. I've got too many names in my head at the moment. But Alan, anyway, I connected with, he uh, would come to the United States and he would lecture on the Lee family of Virginia. So when I first contacted him and I told him I was researching this Jane Bostock sampler with this Alice Lee name on it, he thought I was a family member trying to tie my family into the Lees of Virginia, mm. which everyone wants to do. And he said, yes, he said, I can help, but I charge 150 pounds an hour. <laughs> <laughs> and I took a big gulp, and I wrote back, and I said, Alan, I'm not a family member. I'm researching a piece of needlework, and I'm trying to find the origins of Calm it. down. <laughs> yes. Well, he was most gracious. In fact, he went to the Lee house that's there, and um, I have a picture of the uncle that he sent me. It was a painting. He sent me a picture of the painting. Mm -hmm. And that's included in the book. And I was able to um, pull up the genealogy of Jane Bostock. And England's still angry about that. But <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> is is, is Jane, Jane, Jane was all right, huh? 
Yeah, she was fine. Okay. <laughs> she, yeah, she come from royalty, and the the sampler reflects not an ordinary life. Um, yeah, her her uncle uh, Alice Lee was the daughter of her uncle, and he was the sheriff of the county, and that was a prestigious position to hold. Mm. Uh, Jane Bostock's, I think she was the fifth daughter, and her father had died young. So mom was kind of dependent upon her brother to support them. Uh -huh. And I believe that Jane was probably working in the household of the Lee family, probably babysitting little Alice Lee. And she commemorated the sampler. Oh, okay. You can go to England and you can see it. It's at the Victorian Albert Museum in London, but it's mm -hmm. in the archives. Okay. It used to be in the study room and they've changed things. But, um, I couldn't get to the back side of it, so I can't prove it. But just by looking at it, the bottom portion of it is very sophisticated. Numerous stitches, numerous techniques. And then you look at the top part of it with these scattered motifs. And these scattered motifs all point to the um, heraldry of the family. Uh -huh. And I, I went back and proved all of this as well. But it's done in a simple cross stitch. And I'm thinking... Someone, there was fabric that was left, and someone added this. It wasn't Jane Bostock, uh -huh. but I can't prove it because I can't get to the back of it. Uh -huh. And stitchery, it's like needle or like handwriting. The back side, I can tell you if two or more people have worked on a piece by the way it's stitched. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I could have told immediately. I could have said, no, Jane Bostock did not work this top portion. <laughs> It was done later by another descendant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's that's fun. I uh, I love to look at the back uh, of things of stitching because it. I I, I feel like I learn a lot. Um, well, that's where the story is. You can tell how it was constructed. See, that's where that architecture with men come in. Yeah. You're looking at how it was built. Mm -hmm. If I could use that term, yeah, it was <laughs> built. Yep. Yeah, no, it, it, you know, I, I don't want to look at it to embarrass anyone. I just want to look at it to see how to it was learn, done. Yeah, how how do you go about it? How do you transfer from one to the next? Yep. Uh, if you're doing an alphabet, do you stop with each letter? How you know, and and where have you found ways to not end off and and still not be seen from the front? You know, all those little things. I I think yeah. they're, it's interesting to learn that. Yeah, yeah, it is, and. Uh, what looks like one stitch on the front, and when I turn it over on the back, I know we've created another stitch. Uh huh. And um, that happens too. I think my biggest surprise one day, I'm I'm at a trade show, and a young gal comes in. I think she was a shopkeeper. I can't offhand remember where she was from or anything. She could have been like a visitor with a shopkeeper, but she had a German sampler, and she was anxious for me to see it. And the Germans, instead of the um, the long band samplers that the English are known for, the Germans go horizontally. Hmm. So it's it's wider than it is long. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and it could be two or three columns in its width, okay? Okay. So she brings it to me, and it's a beautiful, beautifully worked sampler, and I'm looking at the front of it, and then I had her turn it over to the back. It was totally reversible. What you see in the front and what you saw in the back was the same. <laughs> <laughs> and let me tell you, that's a technique. <laughs> yep, yep. Yeah, that's. Uh, yeah, I've got one that's uh, I'm doing reversibly, and it's been put away for a while. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. You got to be totally concentrated on it. Yeah. What stitch are you using? Marking stitch. Uh, well, this is the uh, the Queen Sampler, uh, the Linda Vinson design. From uh, well, I can't remember her name, but um, uh, the one that really drained me was the Montenegrin stitch. And, oh, uh, okay. I got it. I got it. But, okay. But uh, <clears throat> it sapped the enthusiasm. Then other things came <laughs> came to play, okay. and and I haven't gone back. <laughs> but it's one I will finish because it's so beautiful that I want it. Okay. You know, I want I want it finished, and I want to have it. But uh, that, yeah, stitching it reversibly, and yeah, you really have to pay attention. Uh, yeah, you do. Um, 
Well, there are three marking stitches. One will give you a cross stitch on the front and a um, four-sided stitch on the back. Yep. One will give you a four-sided stitch on the front and a cross stitch on the back. And then the other marking stitch is a cross stitch on the front and a cross stitch on the back. Yep. Well, that was the first yeah. alpha. That's the first alphabet in this uh, sampler. <laughs> is that yes? Okay. And I chose I chose the one that gives you the uh, box on the back, the square is on the back. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay. Yeah. Because yeah. it you, was. You still have to. You still have to pay attention while they're oh, yeah. stroke. Oh, I can't tell you how many times I flipped that thing over and I'd made a cross on the back. It's like, oh, come on. It just... <laughs> how did I do this? Yeah. Pay attention. Yeah. No. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So, no, it'll get done someday, and uh, I'll be proud of it. But um... Yeah, you know those marking stitches were used for a purpose. Um, if you had, like, towels that you were going to use, something that would be seen on the front and the back side, like a cuff of a, a garment. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's where the marking stitches yep. would be used. So it would be perfect on the front and perfect on the back. Yeah. yeah. And then hiding, hiding where you end off. Yeah. All oh, those yeah. things. Yeah. Oh. Yep. Yeah. Hiding off black work is a, oh. is a trick. <laughs> yeah. See, I've never done black work. I, and, and the really good stuff fascinates me because what people do with just thickness of thread and density and, yes. um, and then to do it and you can't tell where they start or end is just, yeah. Impressive. It's awesome. It yeah. really is. Um, it, there's a misconception out there, and of course I know this because I've been to Europe many times and studied various collections. Uh, it's a misnomer. They feel that all black work is reversible. Well, it is if it was used on a garment where both sides would be seen, mm -hmm. again, like a cuff area or a neck area. But if it was being used for a household product um, where it was going to receive a lot of wear, a back stitch would be used because it's a stronger stitch. Ah, uh huh. Yeah. So it doesn't have to be reversible unless you want it to be. But then if you're going to put it in a frame, you're not going to see both sides of it. Does it really matter? Nope. <laughs> no. Okay. Yeah, and, and and the day I attempt black work, I will not do it reversibly. I guarantee you. No, just gonna. Oh, Gary, Gary. <laughs> no. No, I just want to get the front right. <laughs> I teach a class in reversible black work. You can't tell me that. <laughs> oh, well, maybe someday. I just would want to get okay. the front right and have okay. it look good. So. You might have to, I might have to give you one-on-one -on -one classes right online here. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, okay. we could do that. Eileen, I really enjoyed it. Thank you for taking the time today. I appreciate it. Oh, it's been a pleasure, Gary. Yep. And thanks to everybody for listening. <laughs>